let us pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I ask you, Lord, to open up your word. Help us to take and receive from your word what you'd have us to receive. Move mightily with us. Lead, guide, and direct. Show us your will and way in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Let us turn to Matthew chapter tw uh, 22, starting with the 23rd verse. That's Matthew chapter 22, starting with the 23rd verse. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say uh, there, there is no resurrection, and, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, If a man die having children, his, bro uh, his brother sh uh, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there, uh, there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, de deceased and having no issue, who left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And the last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For, she, for they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, ye, ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection there is neither Mary, Mary nor given in marriage, as, but are as the angels of, of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have ye not read that, it, that which was spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. We live in a society that's almost as messed up as the one that they were in. Maybe more, well. And... You have two different uh, categories of of churches out there teaching false doctrines on this very uh, scripture. You have those that, like the Sadducees, want to do away with life after death. And then you've got others that want to make all our loved ones angels. The Bible says we'll be like the angels, not that we will be angels. There's nothing in the scriptures that ever says that we are going to die and become angels. We will die and become a spiritual being until the, re until the resurrection. And then at the resurrection, we're reunited with our bodies, and we continue going on with the same life that we had in heaven before we were reunited with the body. Not that you would notice, because time doesn't exist there. We are a we as humans tend to look through, through life in a very limited fashion. Because we have a finite mind. And because of that finite mind, we don't understand everything about, well, we don't understand anything about heaven. Except that it says that we will, uh, that, that we are alive. Because God is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. And that we will be like the angels. And we will be like Christ. Now, when we think about that, that, that carries forth certain characteristics. What are angels like? Many people have some very wild misconceptions of angels. But the Bible says very specifically, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. So we know that in heaven, God's will is done. So the angels do not disobey God. This entire notion that an angel can disobey God is blasphemy. Angels obey God. So, we uh, to be like the angels, we have to be obedient to God. Angels are holy beings. So, to be like the angels, we have to be a holy being. Angels are a supernatural being. So to be like the angels, we have to be a supernatural being. And Christ was sinless. So to be like Christ, we have to be sinless. Sin does not enter into heaven. So we have these definitions that we, this is what we know about heaven. People go through and they talk about the streets of gold and about uh, the pearly gates and all the time not taking and looking at the fact that that's a description of the bride, Zion, which is the church. Does it, uh, does it qualify for, uh, for heaven? Only metaphorically speaking because the fact that it's talking about the people that go to heaven. It's not talking about the location. We know absolutely nothing about what heaven's going to be like, except that it's going to be a place without pain, without sorrow, and without sin. So, we, we, if it's a place without pain, sorrow, and no sin, it's a pretty wonderful place. We don't have to take and go through and and be like the Sadducees and say, oh, well, this is all we've got, so we need to take and live the for the moment and have everything now. That's the way the world thinks. When you think about it, all these people that are taking and chasing after things, they are looking at no future. Because their obsession is with the now. Oh, don't get me wrong, we all like to have things. But we need to keep the things in the right priority. I know a person that one time bought a three million dollar yacht. And you know, that yacht floated. I never was on it. I've never been there on it. So <laughs> he never even invited me to go on it. <laughs> So, so I, so I, I've seen pictures, <laughs> but it floated in the water. It traveled from place to place. You could sleep on it. You know, there's a lot of boats that can fit that same description that don't cost anywhere near three million dollars. <laughs> But why? Oh, I can't. I am not going to, to judge the person for for it because I know they didn't spend three million dollars for it. They got it on uh, on an auction. But that's what its value was. the The thing is, is that. It's gone now. They don't still have it. It was a temporary thing. As nice as it was, it was a temporary thing. Now, we can take and look at people that go out and spend $100,000 on a car. And others that take and go out and they'll spend... What uh, the least they can get by with. <laughs> That's getting more and more expensive all the time. But both vehicles go from point A to point B. 
One might be more comfortable going from point A to point B, but they both go from point A to point B. One might be faster at going from point A to point B, but that's just a ticket waiting to happen. And they both are only temporary. The focus shouldn't be on the items. The focus should be on God, because that's the only thing that's not temporary. When we take and we look at all of this focus, all of this hoopla on whose wife will she be? Just to find out there is no marriage in heaven, because angels don't reproduce. And apparently, neither do we in heaven. Unlike what the Mormons say. The Bible's very clear that the important thing in heaven is God. We are in the presence of the living God. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting with the 13th verse. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But con continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to bring thee to uh, able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we see, first of all, evil men are going to continue. It says that evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. So some of these people out there deceiving other people are deceived themselves. They honestly believe they're right. What they're following are ways that are contradictory to God. They violate the scriptures. They don't follow the scriptures. And because of the arrogance of man's hubris, they are taking and holding on, thinking they know more than God. I know people that know more about so-called theories, that is scientific theories, than they know about Bible. And the problem is, is that the so-called scientific theories aren't even scientific. They'll go through and they'll tell you, oh, well, this planet has this kind of atmosphere and that planet has that kind of atmosphere and this other planet has another kind of atmosphere. Uh, how do they know? Nobody's been there. They're going by the color of the planet. Anything could cause it to be a, co a different color. We don't know why it's that color. We don't know if it actually has more of a certain type of gas than another kind of gas. We haven't been there, so we wouldn't be able to test it even. It's a theory. They could be right. They could be wrong. And a lot of their theories don't hold any water. After all, you tell somebody that you kiss a frog and it becomes a prince, and, it's, and all of a sudden it's a fairy tale. Tell somebody that over the course of a billion years, that frog tr evolves into a, a prince, and suddenly it's science. No, it's still a fairy tale. It's just 
taking the princess out of the story. And frankly, the story's more interesting with the princess. <laughs> when you look at what science is, science is observable, measurable, testable, repeatable, and provable. If you can't do that, it's not science. It is religion. And there's a lot of people that have substituted a science name for their religion when all they're doing is worshiping a God other than God. You know they're still teaching things in schools as science that were proven wrong back in the uh, in the renaissance times see dur for, uh, b during the time of the renaissance they used to believe that however big you were you had a stronger gravitational pull so, a scientist decided to test that. He went up on the top of a tower and started dropping rocks and timing them till they hit the ground. And what he discovered was, is no matter how big the rock was, it hit the ground at the same time as all the other rocks that were dropped off, no matter how small they were. Gravity affected them all equally. So it didn't matter their size. Well, they're still saying, well, the moon holds its place and has its gravitational pull, pull because of its size and mass. No, it has its gravitational pull, pull because God created it to. Would it have a greater ma uh, gravitational pull if it was bigger? Mm, probably not. Because God created it to have a certain gravitational pull. They, they don't include God. And so by excluding God, they take out the most powerful variable they can have. When God says something, uh, let it be, it is. It's not, it might be. So these deceivers are convincing themselves that something that can't be proven is true, even when it's been proven false. It's kind of like these idiots that are going through saying, oh, well, you know, there's 50 different genders. I can't even imagine where they're coming up with 50 different genders. One thing that my son pointed out re uh, just yesterday, he said these people who are calling themselves trans, by calling themselves trans are admitting that they are something other than what they're claiming. Because to transition is to move from one thing to another. So if they are a trans male, they're admitting that they were they are a female and they're moving towards being a male. And a trans female is admitting they are a male moving towards being a female. And of course, it's impossible to move towards the opposite gender. So they're saying they're moving towards a lie. But they're admitting they are male or female. Said under that uh, under that definition, these people who are anorexics are trans fat. I know that was a meme, but the meme went opposite. The meme said that if you were fat, uh, fat, and in denial, you were trans fat. 
But the fact is, is that at anorexics are skinny and claiming to be fat. So they're trans fat. <laughs> the basic concepts behind truth, truth is an absolute. There is no your truth, my truth, somebody else's truth. There is the truth, and then there is fiction. Now, there are things that we don't know. They may, not, they may be true, they may not be true, because we don't know it. But that's ignorance. That's not stating something's a fact or a fiction. There are many people today that are stating fact is fiction. And fiction is fact. And a, and a lot of it comes down to the fact that they're not putting any weight in the scriptures. Because it's the scriptures that can make us wise. It's not the world that makes us wise. It's the scriptures. And the scriptures is profitable for taking and bringing us to salvation through faith. If we take the scriptures out of the out of the picture, like some people say, oh wow, well, let's just leave the Bible out of it. Then you're taking faith and salvation out of it. It comes down to the scriptures are what make us wise. The scriptures are what lead us to salvation. The scriptures are what shows us who Jesus Christ is. We know that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It's God breathed. That's what the term means. And is good, profitable for doctrine. It tells us what we are to believe. I know people like to pick and choose from the Bible what they want to believe. But the Bible teaches us what we should believe. It is profitable for reproof. It tells us when we're wrong. Boy, people hate that. Whether it be man or God telling them they're wrong, they hate it. But you know, the Bible doesn't just stop there. It tells us how to fix what's wrong. It's profitable for correction too. It tells us how to make right what is wrong. It gives us instructions in righteousness. It tells us how to live our lives. And what gets me is so many people today think that they can't be a good Christian unless they're living perverted lives. There's something wrong here. Because that isn't how God works. Why? So that we can be perfect. Oh, I don't know how many times I've heard people say, oh, well, nobody's perfect. That isn't what the Bible says. I've heard preachers take and say, oh, nobody's perfect. I have seen church shirts that go through and say that nobody's perfect. And the Bible says, be ye perfect as the Father in heaven's perfect. So we're supposed to be as perfect as God. Oh, people say, oh, you're so arrogant. Just thinking you can be that perfect. The Bible says it. Are we going to believe the Bible or are we, going to, are we not? One problem is the definition of perfect. Perfect does not mean you don't make mistakes. Unless you're God. Perfect doesn't mean you know everything. Perfect is to be complete or as designed. So for us to be a perfect human, we have to be complete and as designed. But we are not complete without God in our lives. We are also not living as we were designed without God in our lives. Because God had an intimate relationship with Adam and Eve when he created them. He walked with them in the cool of the evening. 
If we're not walking with God, we don't have the relationship that we were designed to have, and therefore we would not be perfect. But if we are walking with God, we are perfect. Don't have to be the brightest, uh, brightest bulb in the box. We just have to be walking with God. See, too many people are trying to make, say, well, to be perfect, you've got to be God. No, you just have to be as designed. And that makes a huge difference to what God is trying to get us to be. He's trying to make us what we were designed to be. Man destroys that design. So following man's teachings is just going to ruin things. So we need to take and follow God. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting with the first verse. That's 1 Timothy chapter 4, starting with the first verse. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils speaking lies and hypocrisies, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Okay, the latter times. We are in the latter times. We have been in the latter times for the last 2,000 years. The Bible says that in the latter times, Christ would come. Christ came. We are in the latter times. So, so, the, so if in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, we know that people have been departing from the faith since the time of Christ till today. It's nothing new, and it's not going to stop until Christ returns. So we have people that will turn and walk away from God. I don't care how much various churches try to take and say, oh, well, once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never lose it. That isn't what the Scripture says. The Scripture says there are those that will depart from the faith. They'll reject God and walk away. And why are they rejecting God? Because they're taking heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Beliefs that contradict the word of God. Well, we know from past history there are preachers that were doing great things for God that turned around and walked away from God. And majority of them, or actually I don't know of any of them, that when they, uh, they came back. We can take a look at J.C. Fisher, the one who wrote I Am Redeemed in our hymnal. Decided he got tired of his wife. She was no longer pretty, and so therefore he had to go get him another one. When, it, when people came to him and said, you can't do that, that's unbiblical, it's wrong, it's sin. He did it anyway. And he walked away from God. D.S. Warner's wife was a traveling evangelist, took and ended up taking and following the, uh, a cult leader and walking away from God. Divorced her husband and pursued cult doctrine. Hmm? And was never happy afterward. Destroyed her life. But there's no indication she ever came back either. They gave heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. We took and recently listened to an interview of a televangelist that took and 
rejected the existence of God after they had been taking and preaching uh, across the country with to huge crowds yeah, across the world, yes. And the result died not believing in God. They believed seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. They turned away from the truth. The Bible tells us what we are to believe. The devil is trying to destroy us. And they, and they developed this callousness, this harshness, this, well, their conscience is seared with a hot iron. They can actually do just about anything. You know, they stated that in Germany in the 1930s, most churches in Germany opposed what the Nazis stood for. But they refused to speak up about it. Because they were afraid of the backlash. And when the Nazis started gathering up Jews and taking them away, they kept silent. Well, when they put them in the ghettos first, they kept silent. Then when they put them in the, it started gathering up and shipping them away, they kept silent. Then the Nazis came for them. We've got to take a stand for the truth and not give in to the world. To, uh, I don't know how many times I've heard Church of God preachers tell me, oh, well, you can't be going out and saying that that's wrong. You've got to keep quiet. You're going to offend people. I'd rather offend someone into heaven than to give them a shove into hell while patting them on the back. Does that mean there's consequences? Sure, there's consequences to it. There's members of my family that won't even talk to me. My mother disowned me. But, but God says he comes first. The truth is the truth we cannot not. I know that's a triple negative there. Uh, uh, tell it. See, a double negative, and it becomes a positive. Triple negative, it's a negative again. <laughs> we cannot avoid telling the truth. If we keep silent, We're just letting people go to hell. And there is no love in that. Yes, some won't hear us. They've got their conscience seared. They can't feel anything anymore. Some are, God aren't, isn't even talking to anymore. And it takes God to draw them. Let's look at Titus. Chapter 1, starting with the 7th verse. For a bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angered, not given to wine, not a, no striker, not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, uh, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the uh, the faithfulness, the holding fast the faithful word, as he hath been taught, that he may be able with, by sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. 
For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who uh, subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. So we find that a bishop must be blameless. So a minister of God must be blameless. And a steward of God. So they have, have to be upholding everything in the business of God. They have a certain characteristic of lifestyle that they have to uphold. Too many people say, oh, well, well you can't take go through and require more from the preacher than you do from the congregants. And you know that's true. Because anybody in the congregation should be able to fit the same description. But that doesn't change the fact that if he's going to be teaching, he needs to be in the right place with God and be living the life. Yes, all those things should be uh, uh, should be qual uh, qualities that the whole congregation of, uh, holds. But it should be especially true with the person doing the teaching. And we get to the point where it says, is to exhort and convince the gainsayer. I don't know how many times I've had people say, oh, well, you shouldn't argue the Bible. Well, what else are you going to argue? You can't con get, convince the gainsayer without evidence, and the only evidence we have that carries any real weight is the Bible. My opinion is no better than your opinion. Are we going to go to man to determine what uh, to, uh, uh, we're supposed to use for evidence when arguing the scriptures? That makes no sense. We take it to the Bible. Oh, I know that they don't want you to do that nowadays. They frowned upon it when I was in Bible college. They found, frowned on it even more by the time I got into the uh, pastorate. Now, you run into people on the streets that frown on it. But the fact is, that's because they've been convinced that, oh no, you can't take and discuss the Bible with people. Doctrines of devils. Because the devil doesn't want them to take and receive the Bible because if they receive the Bible, they receive the method in order to receive salvation. They don't, they don't want people to receive salvation. The devil's opposed to that. So they try to stop us at every turn. That means we need to try all the harder. Let's go to 2 John chapter 1, starting with the fourth verse. That's 2 John chapter 1, starting with the fourth verse. I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth as we have received the commandment from the Father. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have learned from the beginning, you should walk in it. For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. And these deceivers, 
this is a deceiver and an antichrist. L uh, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he hath for he that biddeth him God speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. So it starts off commending this woman for teaching her ch uh, her children the truth. It is important that we teach our children the truth. That we ingrain in people what the truth is. Now we can't make them accept it. All we can do is teach it to them. They must either accept it or reject it on their own. But if we're going to love mankind and love each other, we have to walk in the commandments of God. It's amazing how, uh, how it has gotten twisted in our modern age where they think that if you love mankind, that then you can't take and say anything against whatever they're doing. You've got to be accepting of it. You've got to lift them up and support them. That's the same as offering them God's speed, taking and giving them a blessing. You become an accomplice. And the Bible condemns that. We're not supposed to aid them in their evil. We're supposed to condemn the evil and point them to the truth. Too many want to follow the commandments of men rather than the commandments of God because they want to, do, uh, to be evil. They've got this affirmation nonsense that, oh, to love someone, you've got to affirm them. That's essentially what Dr. Spock was teaching in the 60s. And even before he died, he admitted he was wrong. Oh, don't take and spank children. Take and just tell them how great they are. They'll come around. People are naturally good anyway. No, people are naturally evil. And it requires discipline to see there's a consequence for our actions and we should change. It says that those that deny Christ coming in the flesh are antichrist. And they were having a problem with Gnostics doing just that, denying that Christ came in the flesh. Then there was another group that denied he was ever anything but, but flesh. Anyone who takes a stand against the biblical de uh, description of Christ is an antichrist. People are waiting for one great big antichrist to appear and conquer the world. And in actuality, we got them all over the place. Anyone who stands against God. It's not one individual. It's lots of individuals. The man of sin may have been in one particular office of individual, but the actual Antichrist is anybody who's Antichrist. If they're opposed to Christ, they are an Antichrist. That's what the word means. <clears throat> and we have those that are Antichrist and preaching in the churches. We have those that are, well, I remember when we were in Nebraska, one of the ministers there stated point blank that he wasn't even sure God really existed. Another one of the ministers there er, denied the Trinity.
And the one that denied the Trinity was ordained while I was in Nebraska. Uh, so no wonder they really wanted nothing to do with me. <laughs> but it comes down to they are elevating and giving God speed to those who take and stand against God instead of taking and standing against those that stand against God. They're giving them authority. They're giving them positions. They're taking and giving them elevated backing when we should be opposing them. Let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1, starting with the 19th verse. That's Second Peter chapter 1, starting with the 19th verse. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto the light, to a light that shineth in a dark place until the, day, uh, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing th this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is for a private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I know that the problem we we find in our modern age is too many people are saying, oh, well, God's given me a special light that I've seen something that nobody's ever seen before, and I, uh, you need to follow my doctrine, and therefore you'll know that you're uh, going to take and have the, the new light on the subject. God shows new light to us individually, but it's not something nobody else has ever heard of before. It always goes back to the scriptures. It's not for private interpretation. Heard of a preacher taking and going into a church in in Alabama taking and declaring that this, he read a, a, a scripture that had absolutely nothing to do with what he was talking about. And said, say there, that scripture proves that I am meant to be the pastor of your church. And they went with it. It had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with it was for a private interpretation. And he proceeded to to, uh, to, to lead them into the heresy of tongues. He was a devil's emissary. But because they didn't follow the scripture here where it says it's not of a private interpret uh, prophecy, if they had have taken and looked at it and said it's not a private interpretation, you don't get to do that. G get out of the pulpit. They would have saved themselves a lot of heresy and a lot of problems. But they weren't willing to take a stand against that heresy. No, they were willing to take a stand against anybody preaching the truth. Because the truth hurts people's feelings. God wants us to take and preach the word as it's written in context so we don't misinterpret what the Bible actually says. Let's go to John chapter 8, starting with the 31st verse. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage. 
to any man, how sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth forever. If the son therefore sh uh, shall make the you free, you shall be free indeed. Many today want to take and preach that, oh, well, it doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you believe something. Take and you can have, follow any path and it'll all go to the same place. What they, don't, what they don't go and continue telling them is, yeah, it all goes straight to hell. There's only one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ. The truth sets us free. What is it setting us free from? Setting us free from sin. Too many are bound up in sin, letting sin dominate their lives, claiming to be Christians, and all the while, they're condemning their own souls. While others are letting false prophets tell them that things are uh, are sin, the Bible doesn't even teach her sin. But they don't know the Bible well enough to truly live free. They think, oh, well, every thought and deed is a sin. I was tempted, therefore I've sinned. No. It's the yielding of the temptation, the willful disobedience of God, the choosing to walk away. Let's walk with God. Let's follow the word and share the truth to all mankind. Thank you.